Hello again everybody. Sorry for the long delay in uh, making this video. I had planned to get back to making videos two or three weeks ago um, but unfortunately uh, work sort of overtook me and uh, so anyway I'm back now and I'm planning to make another few videos on the RTB2004 again. One a couple of questions that I got asked or certainly um, one question I was asked actually I think was the noise or could I show the noise levels on the scope so I thought I'd start this video just with a demonstration of the noise uh, on the different channels of this scope uh, what I've got set up is all four channels are switched on all four channels are open so there's no actual uh, probes on them they're just open there's no terminators on them or anything and what I've got set up is if we look along the bottom I'll actually use the pointer uh, we've got um, the first uh, channel, channel 1, yellow is set to 1 to 1 probe attenuation, 1 millivolt per division, AC coupled, no bandwidth limit. Channel 2 is still at 1 to 1 uh, probe attenuation, but bandwidth limited now, so to 20 megahertz at 1 millivolt. Channel 3 is at 10 millivolts a division because I've got this set up at 10 to 1 attenuation and it does make a difference which is why I've done it and with no bandwidth limit and channel 4 is bandwidth limited 10 to 1 probe attenuation and 10 millivolts of division again which is the minimum um, now if we look at the actual signals we've got the yellow channel channel 1 green channel 2 orange channel 3 and the blue mode sort of color is channel 4 uh, wave counts I've had this running for a while now so it's down 12,000 wave counts so I've got the statistics mode on I can either go between measuring which is just my normal measuring or my stats mode which I've switched on and I've got this set to RMS because noise is a Gaussian distribution uh, an RMS figure is the normal best me method of measuring noise on a scope to get a good reading for it so I'm using an RMS uh, figure if we look at channel 1 which is 1 millivolt division 1 to 1 probe attenuation with no bandwidth limiting we're getting about which is very impressive 110 microvolts of noise mean so these are the mean figures we've got current figures minimums maximums and mean figures and also standard deviation if we look at channel 2 which again is still 1 to 1 probe attenuation but this time bandwidth limited to 20 megahertz because this scope is a 300 meg scope so no limit is 300 bandwidth limited is to 20 I believe we're down and that's reduced it which you'd expect to uh, to 77 microvolts which is actually very impressive if we go to 10 to 1 probe attenuation with no bandwidth limit we are getting around 1.19 millivolts uh, which is probably to be expected um, and then if we go to the bandwidth limited on the 10 to 1 probe attenuation we're getting 455 microvolts uh, if we look now at the standard deviations you can see that for 1 to 1 probe attenuation uh, we're getting 26 microvolts as a standard deviation with no bandwidth limit and with bandwidth limit we are getting 36 microvolts um, not quite sure why I would have expected that to have been lower on that one which it is on the other one I don't know why that is actually that's a little odd maybe maybe there was a, a peak or something it just happened to pick up some noise if I just re-zero that so I've clicked on this over here which zeroes it back sorry touch the screen so I should use the mouse pointer I'm you touching this which zeroes my wave count back I would have expected um, with bandwidth limiting to have less uh, standard deviation uh, but it's not okay. I'm not sure why that is but anyway that is the way it is um, but the main thing aside from the standard deviation is that the mean figures uh, for uh, one to one probe attenuation are pretty impressive and probably far more impressive than my Rigol which I think um, on one to one would be something in the order of around 300 microvolts um, with bandwidth limiting um, whereas this is about 76 and it would be about the same on my key site I think I haven't done a direct comparison recently but fundamentally these are pretty impressive so that just gives an idea of the noise you can see all the all of the um, traces at the top I've got this on high res at the moment I can change that to say sample it doesn't make an awful lot of odds the only one that makes it slightly uh, smaller is if we average because we're averaging noise so if I average I then go into menu I then enter my average number at say 
um, say 50 averages, although it will slow it down a little bit. Um, you can see the trace gets a lot thinner. If I now get rid of that menu and I now click that, let's just have a look at one-to-one -one attenuation and you can see we're down to, on bandwidth limit, no, without bandwidth limiting, we're down to about 49, no, that's right, 49 uh, is the mean uh, with bandwidth limiting, we're looking at about 63 microvolts. Um, don't know why that should be again, because in actual fact, a bit puzzled on that, it should be the other way round. But anyway, those, it might just be that that's a noisier channel, perhaps, on the, the circuit board, because we're not talking about an awfully di big difference. We're only talking about 14 microvolts. Um, but all of these are pretty impressive. But you can see with the averaging that it has dropped naturally, so that this one was over a millivolt previously, channel 3, which was... 10 to 1, no bandwidth limit. Now with averaging we're down to 880, but obviously the scope's running slower. You can see that from the wave count that we're now at about 1300 wave counts. So you can see that we're running slower. But that gives an idea anyway of the of the noise. I'm going to just show the accuracy um, of the voltmeter by now showing it with um, just measuring a battery, just to get a stable DC battery, just to get a, a, a stable voltage uh, with a Agilent uh, DMM. Um, and comparing it to the DMM of this just to see how that uh, that uh, that measures out. So I'll be back in a second once I've set that up. Right, I've set up the uh, battery now. I'm just measuring a um, it's actually a remote control battery from um, one of my son's toys. Actually, um, I'm showing on the left. There's an Agilent U1253B, uh, which is quite an accurate digital uh, multimeter. Uh, it's got the OLED display, which is why it's flickering slightly. It's not in reality, it's just not uh, because of the video syncing um, or the shutter on the uh, video camera. It's just syncing that way, so it looks like it's it's fading, but it's not. Um, but you've got a voltage there of 8.471 um, volts, and I reckon that that adjunct is pretty accurate. Um, now, when you look at the scope. I've got the scope set up just for channel 1 now. I've got it at 940 millivolts per division so I'm trying to maximize the ADC um, accuracy by using virtually all the scopes um, range of the ADC and what I've got actually which is very impressive I've got it on voltage peak to peak uh, sorry voltage peak plus so I'm measuring from the uh, ground level up and it's a DC voltage which would be sensible and we're getting um, Quite a lot of decimal places here. I've got this on average mode with eight averages running, and we're getting uh, on the bottom of the scope. In case you can't read it clearly, it's 8.469, um, and it's going to 8.470, 8.471, 8.472. Um, it's it's bouncing around a little bit because of the noise, but it's still pretty impressive. And we've got uh, one, two, three. What have we got? Four, um, four decimal pl four digits after the decimal point which is uh, quite impressive now that's on eight averages the top here is the DC meter which obviously is read in a different way I don't quite know how they do that because it's obviously not coming from the same quite the same um, thing maybe it's not averaging it out um, but nevertheless that's 8.45 so we're not far off so that's probably you know we haven't got a third digit so it could be it could be four five four I don't know if it'll round up our over five or six but so we're still not far out because we've got 8.471 471 millivolts and that's giving us 450 millivolts so that DC meter is fairly accurate um, but what is incredibly accurate uh, is the scale at the bottom which is coming off the display uh, and I'm getting 8.470 um, 8.471 it's bouncing around but so it's virtually spot on we're, we're literally sort of um, 0.1 uh, sorry we're, we're literally one or two millivolts um, difference and sometimes we're actually sitting right on the correct figure so it's, it's averaging between one and two millivolts difference if I actually switch on you won't be able to see it with the camera angle but if I switch on the stats mode um, I'll just have a look how many counts we've done oh of course we're only we're, because I switched the stats on now we're only just now getting the stats mode coming up but we're getting a mean of 8.47 um, with a standard deviation of 1.45 millivolts, so one millivolt deviation, one under 
8.4 millivolts deviation but basically the mean is 8.470 which uh, I know it's not on screen at the moment because it's slightly over to the thing I think you'll, you'll only be able to see the um, current and the minimum possibly uh, with the camera angle to get the meter in but basically that is spot on so uh, it's quite impressive that if I turn the average if I go and select sample mode uh, let's just see what happens now. I'm going to switch back on to normal measure mode. So, yeah, in actual fact, on normal sample mode, it's gone up to 8.51. So the averaging is definitely helping us out uh, because as soon as I go, that's sample mode. If I now switch on to, say, peak detect, uh, we're still on about 8.51. Go high resolution, we're about 8.46. So it's pretty close. Again, we're only um, sort of um, 10 millivolts out. But if we go on to average, and I've only put in an average of um, a small number of averages of eight averages, we are then almost spot on. If I put averages numbers up, I'm just going to enter an average number. I know it's not on the screen, but I'll just do that. Uh, say um, 36 averages. So let's just see what that gives, gives us. Um, 8.463 so we're about um, 8 mini volts out there but it seemed to actually be the most accurate funny enough I've chosen 8 and if I go back to 8 averages we seem to be getting sorry got the wrong number there put two averages now let's just put 8 averages on and we'll be there yeah, eight averages funny enough it's absolutely spot on within one mini volt or less uh, or bouncing around within one millivolt or less. Um, so that is actually pretty impressive, I think. Um, and the scope has been on for probably an hour to warm up, and the Agilent meter's probably been on for about 20 minutes. I can't leave the Agilent meter on too long because it's got the OLED display. Uh, even though I charged it fully, that um, the meter gets through batteries. It's rechargeable, but it, it eats batteries at an alarming rate. It's a, it's a lovely meter. I like the Agilent U1253B and I think the display is fantastic. Um, my track's just gone off. <laughs> um, but um, it is extremely Im impressive um, uh, in terms of the actual display and how you can read it. Um, it just It's just clear across the lab. You can see it very clearly. Um, and we've got about 17.4 degrees, so we're almost room temperature, a little bit colder than room temperature here in the lab. But anyway, that, that just shows um, shows the, the degree of accuracy. Um, and again, it's impressive probably because of the 10-bit the ADC. Um, the final thing I wanted to show in the video was the decoding of an I2C signal again. Uh, on one of my previous videos I didn't realise that I hadn't actually compensated the probes uh, or one of the channels I hadn't compensated the probes properly and because of that um, the I think it was the clock channel uh, the waveform was actually um, very out of shape and I don't know why I didn't notice it on the screen but for some reason I missed it until I looked at the video afterwards and somebody commented on it uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm just taking again signal from my key site it's just the easiest way to get a quick signal out which is an I2C signal and I'm um, triggering on 29 uh, read with a data of 255 which is coming out of the key site and it's a pretty stable um, signal there both the clock at the top and also the actual data signal which is the green one so the yellow is the clock uh, the green one is the data I've zoomed in on a portion of it um, there is a slight sort of shimmy or movement on the signal but I think that's mainly because the key site is generating these signals from an FPGA and it's giving it out at quite a high um, refresh rate so it's, it's changing the data so this is triggering on that but it's doing a very good job of it um, but the signals are also very clean and then at the bottom of the screen you've obviously got the um, address 29 hex read acknowledged uh, data 255 uh, I've got this in decimal actually, although you can change the uh, display there. Obviously this is the signal which is the data and then the clock is at the top. If I actually want to change the um, display of the data, I can do by going into protocol. I can go into display setup and I can one I can turn off the bits which are at the top of the data there just to show you that again. So I can switch those off so they're clean now. I prefer it with the bits on so you can see the bits there 
and I'm displaying that in decimal but I can if I want change it to hexadecimal so I now I've got FFH which is obviously 255 in decimal and it's obviously 29 um, is still the same address because it was 29 hex we were triggering on um, if I go into binary uh, you can actually show the data in binary as well so that data now is all the ones actually obviously it's all the ones sorry because it's 255 so it's eight ones um, so that's uh, all the ones there so you can change that easily if you want to clean up the display a bit more some people don't like the bits on top but I do I can just do that click on that and I've now got rid of the bits so I've now got my data there the other advantage of this as I showed last time is that you can move all of these around uh, obviously the signals you can but you can also move the decode which is one thing that the key site just struggles with you cannot move the decode so if I wanted this decode right at the top of the screen I could put it at the top I could move my channel 2 down dragging that with the mouse move my channel 1 down dragging it with the mouse and then I've got my um, data at the top. The other beauty on this scope also is that the um, data can also be scaled which again you can't do on the key site so I've got that data selected I can now use my size channel and you can see that I'm getting it small that's the smallest, medium, large, that's the largest um, and that has some advantages when you've got more on the screen because when you've got more on the screen um, if you want to look at more signals on the screen you can then go higher vertical um, orientation by making it wider and that will give you a two line display so if I bring it in more if I turn this down you can now see ignore that this is flashing here because this is a changing bit that it's capturing but you can now see that the binary is set up over um, three lines uh, whereas if I go down and scale that uh, you can see now I'm missing some of my data because it's too narrow which is what you might get on the key site because it begins to get lost in the in the length of the signal but with this the beauty of it is you can go upwards like that and now you can still read that um, perfectly um, so you've still got read acknowledge 29 hex and then you've got your 255 there which is obviously all the ones um, so that's it's rather nice actually um, that's flashing there because that's the changing bit and again it's coming in very quickly and you can see that changing there that's not a problem on the scope that's because the key sites uh, changes the bit and an enormous thing and changes a signal at an enormously alarming rate uh, and this is keeping up with it so that's why that's flashing that's not an error on the scope it's just the way it is uh, if I zoom out again to a portion like that you can see it's beautifully stable um, the decode on this scope is phenomenal I, I just can't fault it um, and also the decode is coloured as well so you've got different things for read and writes and acknowledges they're coloured here um, so that was just that I just really wanted to show you um, the decode because I had made a mistake last time and it was wrong uh, and that was purely down to me that I hadn't um, hadn't, uh, skew, uh, hadn't compensated the probes. One thing I did notice was I compensated these probes before I started uh, was that you need to actually for probe compensation I think you've got to have it on one to one uh, if you have it on 10 to 1 it won't actually probe compensate and it comes up with an error but it doesn't tell you it's an error I think it has to be 1 to 1 it's either 1 to 1 or 10 to 1 but if you try and do the automatic probe compensation it doesn't tell you it just doesn't do it or it sort of comes up with an error that they're fully compensated and won't let you do it so I think it has to be in 1 to 1 mode but I'll show that in one of the next videos um, although I think there are videos out there that show the probe compensation but it's quite interesting that if you get it on the wrong setting I a 10 to 1 instead of 1 to 1 you can't actually do it um, and that could probably drive people mad because they're wondering what they're doing wrong and all they've got wrong is that you've got to have it I think on 1 to 1 uh, but I will confirm that uh, I think I've just knocked the um, I think I've just knocked a probe off which is why that's done that yeah I've knocked a probe off I think one of my probes yeah one of my probes has just dropped off which is why that's done that so um, I'll take those off anyway but anyway that's the um, that's the end of the video and uh, we'll see you next time um, which will hopefully be shorter than four weeks hope you've enjoyed it thanks and goodbye <laughs>